who feels comfortable with telling me what are the three main functions of the nephron? Excellent. So reabsorption, secretion, and filtration, but not in that order. What is the order? Filtration first, then reabsorption, then secretion. So what is, where does filtration take place? Bowman's capsule, glomerulus, renal corpuscle is like the two together. Then where is the majority of reabsorption taking place? The proximal convoluted tubule, excellent. And then where does secretion take place? Distal convoluted tubule. Yes. And then at the distal convoluted tubule, we talked about secretion happening. But then, so we have built the tubule, and then we have the blood. And so the whole idea of the kidney is the kidney at the Bowman's capsule, and then going here to the proximal convoluted tubule, PCT, is we've got all the waste, right? And in the blood, there's some waste too, we're making them bigger. So what we have going on is if you're taking the weight or good, like not the waste, and bringing it back to the blood, that's reabsorption. But if you're taking waste from the blood and pumping it into the tubule, that's gonna be secretion. So it's a directional issue of what's just one going to where. You can also even think of it as a component issue where reabsorption is good stuff and secretion is bad things. So you want to put the bad things in the tubule, reabsorption, you want to bring the good stuff to the blood. So you can, however way you think of it. So the renal corpuscle, which we know is made of the glomerulus, filtration is taking place at the renal corpuscle, which is the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So then the majority of reabsorption is taking place right immediately, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. What is in the proximal convoluted tubule that's different than the distal that increases surface area so we can maximize reabsorption? Microvilli, Microvilli yes. Then we go into that loop of Henle. We have a descending limb and an ascending limb. What is the purpose of the, of the loop of Henle first? And then we're going to talk about the structure differences between descending. So overall, what is the purpose of the loop of Henle? Reabsorption of water, very specific to just to water, not just water, but its process is going to be to extract additional water out of the filtrate to keep into the body. The loop of Henle has a descending limb and an ascending limb. Who can tell me the differences between those two in terms of what type of epithelial tissue can be found in each one? Descending and compulsorimus and ascending is Cuboidal. So the descending limb is made of simple squamous epithelial tissue. That tissue is ideal for what action? Diffusion. Diffusion. The ascending limb is made of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. That tissue is ideal for what? Pumping. pumping. Excellent. So what is the ascending limb pumping into the middle of this U-turn? Sodium. So sodium is coming into the U-turn. It gets really concentrated inside here. That concentrated sodium is going to do what is going to happen on the descending limb? What the effects are going to be? Water. Water exactly. Water that's in the descending limb is going to just come out across the really thin, simple squamous epithelial cells. So we're going to add more water leaving the filtrate. And that water leaving the filtrate goes in the tissue, which ultimately is going to be the blood down, even down in there. Okay, so the loop of Henle, we have reabsorption of water in the descending because the simple squamous, reabsorption of sodium in the ascending because the simple cuboidals. The distal convoluted tubule has two jobs. What, the first job of the distal convoluted tubule is, to, is for secretion any large waste that never got filtered in the begin, to begin with at the glomerulus, but still in the blood, in those peritubular capillaries, those large waste molecules are gonna get brought down into the tubule. So this slide, you're definitely gonna wanna know what substances are secreted. 
So what are examples of things that didn't get filtered that we have to now grab and put, dump down into the distal convoluted tubule? So show an idea of that. So this summary slide is kind of a nice slide so we can see that the glomerulus, it has it color coded with arrows. I don't think I printed this one. So this one's just kind of a nice one that you may want to do on your own drawing when you draw out the nephron where you sort of say, hey, at the glomerulus, you've got filtration or just write filtration. And then you've got proximal convoluted tubule. You got all kinds of reabsorption going on. So here's the Lupa Henle, more reabsorption. And then you can just say specific to water. And then the distal convoluted tubules where we have secretion. Of course we have reabsorption, but we're gonna focus on the secretion at that point. So the distal convoluted tubule has two things, secretion being one of them. What was the other thing the distal convoluted tubule does? Or responds to hormones. What are the three hormones that we need to know that it responds to? Aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and atrial natriuretic peptide these three. So these three have hormonal effects. So we have aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. They both do exactly the same thing. They will, I'll draw here, we have a distal convoluted tubule and we have a peritubular capillary that's going to be by it. So this is going to be our blood. This is our filtrate. So it is here that it takes sodium that happens to be in the filtrate. It's going to pump sodium back into the blood. Not so much because we want sodium, but what do we want when we pump sodium? We want the extra water that's located here. I'm just going to do a dotted arrow because the water follows the sodium. So we have pumps for sodium. So what both aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone do is they pump sodium in water. So we end up increasing the water here in the blood, blood water, which increases blood volume blood volume, when you put more volume in your blood, is going to then translate to an increase in blood pressure. So that's how those two work. They work exactly the same way. They just do it for different reasons. Antidiuretic hormone comes from the posterior pituitary. So if your body is hyper concentrated with electrolytes, maybe you're dehydrated, so you need to retain water, to dilute yourself, if you want to think of it that way. So that's the reason why antidiuretic hormone might get, in, get online. But aldosterone, aldosterone's going to get online because angiotensin II told it to leave the adrenal gland, and angiotensin II's job was to increase blood pressure. So even though they do the same thing, they do them for different reasons. They have different negative feedback loops. The third one on this list is atrial natriuretic peptide. What it does is it's going to take any sodium that's in the blood, pump it into the distal convoluted tubule, and then therefore water is gonna go in here. So I'm gonna write this in a different color. I'll do this here. So if we have atrial, I'm just gonna put it an abbreviation, atrionic um, factor, I'll just put ANF, is going to take sodium from the blood into the filtrate, water will follow and go into the filtrate. So we're going to decrease blood volume. And actually we're going to increase urine volume. So obviously if you have less in the blood, you're gonna have more that you're dumping out into the urine. So that's atrial natriuretic peptide or atrial natriuretic factor, either one, depends on what book you look at. So they just do opposite things. One's bringing sodium back in to retain water, have more in your body. One's dumping sodium into the filtrate, so you also dump water along with it.
Does this make sense? Do anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we'll talk about the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is also where I tell you that I lied to you and I'm going to come clean on my lie. So you know how we originally talked about here's our afferent arterial and our glomerulus and our efferent arterial and we have our Bowman's capsule. Do this in a different color. So we have our Bowman's capsule and we have our proximal convoluted tubule and we had a loop of Henle and a distal convoluted tubule and we have then that emptying into a collecting duct. That's our nephron. So all those parts are indeed true. It's placement like this is wrong. So let's just pretend that I'm gonna take this distal convoluted tubule and, we're, and from the point where this loop of Henle and I'm just gonna pivot this back around onto itself. So how it really looks like is this. The loop of Henle loops back distal convoluted tubule is here, comes by here, and our collecting duct comes right by here. So it's folded back on itself. Think about if you're packing for a trip and you have some jeans. You're not just going to throw your jeans in the suitcase unless you're my son. Then, um, so what you do is you take your jeans and then you fold them back together and then you can fold it down. And then you can pack a lot more stuff in your suitcase because you, you fold it nicely. So this is how our kidneys can pack more nephrons in the, they're packed in tighter and more organized having in this structure. So we can put more nephrons in the kidney. So this is actually how it's positioned. The importance to the juxtaglomerular apparatus is let's break down this ridiculous word. Juxta means next to next to the glomerulus. So what we've got going on is next to the glomerulus, we have afferent arterial being blood coming in. The glomerulus is blood, blood capillary, and the efferent leaves. So if our distal convoluted tubule is coming up and around, and the key is the distal convoluted tubule is going to come right next to this in-between area between the afferent and efferent arterioles. There are a bunch of cells in this area that are the juxtaglomerular cells. We have some here and some here. Okay. Not the most beautiful of pictures. So once you have, so I just want to give you a basic overview, then I'll kind of redraw it with a little more precision and we'll go through some language. So what the juxtaglomerular apparatus is, is these two groups of cells. We have juxtaglomerular cells and we have the macula densa cells. Let's make a collecting duct. We have a collecting duct that we know urine is going to bring urine down and ultimately out the renal papilla out into the minor calyx. And it's going to be receiving urine from many different collecting ducts, you know, from other nephrons. So we'll have a focus of this one here. So we have a distal convoluted tubule here that kind of comes around and does its distal stuff. But also, next to these collecting ducts, we actually have interlobular arteries. So what's coming off, maybe I'm drawing too many lines here, what's coming off that interlobular artery is going to be your afferent arterial, I wanted to cross here, I guess, in front of it, to the glomerulus, and you have your efferent arterial leaving. So the critical thing I want you to know is distal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule is coming through here. It's going to drop its urine and it's going to go out. So that's, it's right before it leaves to go into the collecting duct. And then here is our Bowman's capsule. And we have our proximal convoluted tubule, and then I'll do in purple. 
we'll leave that in there. Hopefully that's a little bit better. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus is going to be right here in this area where the distal convoluted tubule comes right next to specifically the afferent arterial. So we're going to have a set of cells that are the macula densa cells. Um, the macula densa cells are going to actually be in the distal convoluted tubule, and they're going to be solute sensor. I'll explain that in a moment. So the cells inside the distal convoluted tubules portion here is a solute sensor, meaning it is like a little probe detecting what's dissolved in the distal convoluted tubule. It's essentially identifying what is the stuff that we are just about to put out to be P, to be the rest of, what are we letting leave the body? Is what we're letting leave the body something we need to get rid of? Or maybe we're dumping out a whole lot of good stuff that we need to actually retain. So it's sensing what's leaving, but more importantly, it's comparing it to what's coming in. So it's sort of like, I'm just making it up. If you drank or ate like a thing of canned soup that we know has a lot of sodium in it. And so you have transiently really high sodium levels in your body. And so the kidneys are like, hey, we've got a lot of sodium. So let's just ignore the water component with it. Just more of it just as an ion, something that we may have higher than normal levels that we need. Our nephron goes to work keeping some of it in the filtrate so we can pee that excessive amount of sodium out. After a while, we've done our job. So the macula densa is sensing like, hey, this is a lot of sodium going out into the urine and sensing over in the afferent arterial saying, we really don't have that much extra sodium. Do we really need to be sending this much out? So it's a comparison to make sure what we're excreting is indeed what we're in excess of that's arriving. So it's a double check that what we're letting out in the solutes is indeed something that we want to let out. So that's the macula densa. So it's more of a double check of what's going out in the urine. The other component on the top, in purple, is going to be cells. So I'm gonna go over here and call these juxta. juxtaglomerular cells, they're going to be in the afferent arterial. And they have two jobs. One is going to be, it's a pressure sensor. And the other, it's going to be an oxygen sensor. So I want you to right now just view it as just basic categories. The juxtaglomerular cell, it's in the blood. So it's a blood monitor, it's in the afferent arterial. And what is it monitoring? Oxygen levels and blood pressure. The kidney hates low blood pressure because it can't filter if it doesn't have enough blood pressure. So what is the proper name for a pressure sensor? Thank you, baroreceptor. So we can actually just, one, I wanted conceptually to know that, but technically I prefer you to know it as, <coughs> as a baroreceptor. When the kidney's baroreceptor tells you that the pressure is low, what is, good, what is gonna happen? What is it? Excellent. So then we're going to release renin. 
who remembers what happens to renin when it hits the blood? It turns, it combines with, so we're going to go with angiotensinogen to become angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 comes back to the right side of the heart. It then gets sent out to the lungs. What is in high concentration in the lungs? Yep, so we have our ACE, which is our angiotensin converting enzyme. So that is going to make our angiotensin 1 become angiotensin 2, right? Angiotensin 2 is our one of our highly potent vasoconstrictors. So angiotensin 2 does two things. It's going to cause direct vasoconstriction. which is going to increase your blood pressure. You guys really are getting back into the vault of your brain. You'll remember that it's targeting the tunica media of those muscular arterioles systemically. So they're all gonna kind of reduce their diameter um, amount and then it just raises the blood pressure immensely. We can also see where ACE inhibitors prevent the conversion. So it's one of the most effective uh, medications for blood pressure management. We also have ARBs, ARBs over here, angiotensin receptor blocker that actually plugs up the receptor. So angiotensin 2 can't go in and make it happen. So that's how those work. The angiotensin 2 first and foremost directly affects the tunica media causing vasoconstriction. It then also stimulates aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And so what's the big deal with aldosterone? What does aldosterone do? Increases blood pressure how? Excellent. So aldosterone, we did this a little bit earlier, and I'll just put it in a different color because it's not a direct effect of the angiotensin II. The aldosterone, we're going to retain sodium, which equals increasing water, which means we're going to increase blood volume. So angiotensin II directly increases blood pressure, as well as indirectly through aldosterone increases blood volume. So if you are, an everyday example would be, say if you're out in your yard, you're watering the grass, and you want to spray a little bit further. You want to have a little higher pressure. So the first thing you're going to do is just put your thumb over the hose, and it's going to shoot out a little bit more. That's vasoconstriction, because you just reduce the size of the opening. That's vasoconstriction. Then maybe you yell at somebody to go turn on the water a little bit more from the house. Now you're increasing blood volume. So those two things together, more volume in the pipe and a smaller space. That's why angiotensin II is the target for most of the pharmaceutical interventions for blood pressure. Back to the kidney, here in the juxtaglomerular apparatus, it is the baroreceptors in this afferent arteriole that's really where the renin's coming from, only in response to low pressure. You guys comfortable with that? Gets a little crazy fast around here. But as long as you can kind of walk it through and at least get the concepts down and then map it out in a way that you guys feel more comfortable with. Because I find that learning and how things go in your head is a very, very individual process. And you really have to categorize information before you can kind of fill it with the facts. Otherwise, the facts just become like a steamroller and you sort of get, you know, so if you can kind of, if this is good or not, if you want to just at least have the facts down and then reappropriate them in a way that's going to be a little more logical for you. Okay, so that's the baroreceptor story. Other component, the other component of the juxtaglomerular cells is the oxygen sensor. So because oxygen, oops, what type of sensor is it better known as? A chemoreceptor. 
And a chemoreceptor obviously means chemical, so we're chemoreceptor specific for oxygen. If the oxygen is too low, what is it going to release? Perfect, a erythropoietin, often abbreviated as EPO, banned substance in athletic events. Erythropoietin leaves the juxtaglomerular cells in the afferent arterial within the kidney when you go to low oxygen levels. Say we all decide to take a big trip up to Colorado and we're gonna hang out there for a while, then we will be at higher altitude less ambient available oxygen molecules. Our juxtaglomerular cells, the chemoreceptors say, hey, there's a little less oxygen in here than there normally is. Hey, erythropoietin, why don't you head on out to the bone marrow, target the bone marrow, and increase our red blood cell production. And then you end up with what condition in your blood? Polycythemia. That's just connecting the dots back to unit two, you know. Okay, so does that feel, so if we go back here to our juxtaglomerular apparatus, you have the macula densa cells, which are more checking the solute. Are we peeing out what indeed we have too much of? So it's comparing what's coming in the afferent arterial versus what's going out the distal convoluted tubule. Then the juxtaglomerular cells are Let's check out oxygen, let's check out pressure, and if either one of them are low, we have a series of hormones or a hormone that will respond to that and the pathway for that. So on this picture, the orange cells are going to be here, the macula densa cells that are going to not only be checking the solute concentration here in the distal convoluted tubule, but comparing it to the waste that's going to be in the afferent arterial. Again, just to make sure what's going out that's going to end up be going into the urine is indeed what we have too much of coming in in the first place. All right, then the juxtaglomerular cells are going to be right here, but facing the afferent arterial, that one's often wrapped around on both sides. So the cells here are going to be oxygen sensors, and blood pressure sensors. If the oxygen is going to be too low, we're going to send out erythropoietin, which tells the bone marrow, kick out more red blood cells. If the blood pressure is too low, it's going to send out renin, and you're ultimately, through a number of steps, is going to get angiotensin too. I want you to remember that the whole point of our nephron, so this is a single nephron, and then we obviously have a second one on here on this slide as well. But the whole point of a nephron is what ends up coming out these collecting ducts, and here's another collecting duct here, is really what's gonna drip out the renal papilla at the bottom. And whatever comes out, urine is basically dripping out like a drip coffee maker. It's just gonna drip, drip, drip continuously into the minor calyces. There. So the pink part, yes, so the pink part here would be a pyramid, and then up here, the tan part is going to be the cortex. Excellent. This picture is a just a picture for nostalgia for me because it was from my old textbook. The and I keep it in here because literally up until five or six years ago you could not find, at least online, or, you know, outside of going into a decent textbook, a picture of the nephron folded back over. It was always drawn out like I did for you the other day, because obviously that's the easiest way to teach and present it in a less confusing way. But here I want you to notice up on this upper picture, you can see where you have the glomerulus, they draw this weird large red thing, that's gonna be the juxtaglomerular area. You have the glomerulus, um, and then you can see the tubule coming around and you can see the loop of Henle coming back up towards and the distal coming right by it. So the blood pressure hormones, we'll do this quickly because we just did them in essence. There are four blood pressure hormones that you need to be responsible for. The first three on this list are going to have what effect on blood pressure? Yes, all of these are going to increase blood pressure. Tell me which ones of those three have a direct effect on the distal 
convoluted tubule. Excellent. Antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. What is the effect of the middle one, angiotensin 2? How does it raise blood pressure? Yep, it actually tells aldosterone, so it, it does it that way, and it has its own job too. It personally goes out to all the tunica medias, all the muscular arterioles, and causes major vasoconstriction. So that's how it's direct effect. And then the two that are circled on this image or on this slide are the ones that are actually having a direct effect of bringing in sodium back to the blood, which brings in water, and now we increase our blood volume. Atrial natriuretic peptide at the bottom. Who can tell me the effect that atrial natriuretic peptide has on the distal convoluted tubule? What's happening at that point? What is it telling it to do? Secretion of sodium. So then for our what result? So water, exactly. Water will get into the tubule and now you have more water in the urine. Atrial natriuretic peptide is released under circumstances when we have too much blood volume. How it starts is the right atrium gets stretched out because there's too much volume. And it's the stretching out of the right atrium that this hormone gets released. And it tells the kidneys, hey, we're way full up there in cardiac land. Could you let some of the water go? And that's really its job. And it's the only um, hormone that we have that lowers blood pressure. Increased blood pressure or volume are going to be our angiotensin II, aldosterone, and antidiuretic hormone. Decrease in blood pressure is atrial natriuretic peptide or factor. This is a recap of the renin angiotensin system. We did this in unit two. This is more, this is about the angiotensin II where we first constrict smooth muscles. This is just a recap of what I've said earlier. This is like you have vasoconstriction, and you release aldosterone. Angiotensin II has those two jobs. Alcohol decreases antidiuretic hormone. In general, we tend to be more dehydrated. Like we're always kind of needing water. We tend to get water. We're always kind of thirsty. Very rarely do we drink sufficient amounts of water that our body's just perfect, that we're drinking all that we should because um, we're drinking coffee and things that tend to promote more water loss. So think of us as kind of needing our antidiuretic hormone on a regular basis to kind of help hold in some extra water. If we have alcohol, whether it's beer or, you know, you're getting a shot of whiskey or whether whatever your, you know, favorite alcoholic beverage would be, what alcohol does or one amongst many other things it does, but one of the things it does with regard to this in particular is tells the posterior pituitary Let's just, we don't need as much antidiuretic hormone. So you stop your antidiuretic. So just alone, don't even think of it as a volume issue. You're going to now pee out more just because you're not retaining as much as if you're inhibiting your antidiuretic hormone. Urine. Because you can see the calyces quite nicely, the ureter. There was obviously a problem with this guy's left ureter. I forget what the story was on this. But you can also see when you do one of the scans of the kidneys, you have to drink a drink that has some sort of fluorescing component with it, and you, they don't let you pee. So your bladder has to be full. And, but I like this picture, because it's different than another picture I have, because the critical element is that the ureter is entering the back inferior portion of the bladder. Most of the diagrams that you're going to see in the textbooks are going to be wrong when it comes to this. Most of the, and I'll show you why that is, but a lot of the artists that draw are not necessarily anatomists that's really seen the backside of a bladder. You guys will be one of the rare groups that gets to see the backside of the bladder, but we'll be looking at it when we get to the reproductive system. I have a bladder in a bucket, if you will, so we'll be seeing some of my fun little toys in there. So this is just a summary so I don't have to write this down. It's really just saying, how do we get to urine? What do we do? Up here is just filtration, reabsorption, secretion. The whole nephron story, what's left over is pretty much filtrate. What's left over in the filtrate becomes urine. That's all.
So the composition of urine is that it's gonna be obviously mostly water. And that's what we can, you know, make it more concentrated, less concentration. The color of urine, the yellow, is based on bilirubin. Bilirubin also is the color of our feces and makes it brown. Urine is going to have a variety of odors depending on what you're eating. So it could vary based on different components. The pH is just, it could be anything, but not anything, but some people are alkaline, some people are acidic. So there's gonna be a pH characteristic to urine. And then specific gravity. Specific gravity is the solute concentration of urine. Meaning if the specific gravity is just like distilled water and there's nothing in urine but just the water, no other components, then you end up with a specific gravity of 1.0. That's like distilled water. But because we know urine has stuff in it, it's gonna be greater than 1.0 and how concentrated it is, maybe you have more water that got reabsorbed so it's more concentrated, the number is gonna get greater beyond that. It's gonna tell you the solute, and it'll give you a sense of the solute concentration of the urine. So the less concentrated your urine is, the more watery it is, the closer to one it will be. The more concentrated it is, the further away from one it will be. So the waste components that are in urine, because the whole point of making urine is getting rid of waste. Ammonium. So this is just the junk that gets out into our urine. So the ammonium turns into ammonia, which is what gives our urine the stinky smell over time. And that's why actually urine stinks worse over time, because it comes out as ammonium, which is not as stinky. But as one of the H pluses disassociate off, it becomes ammonia. So that's how the urine smell can actually increase in intensity as time goes on. So these are the waste components and a lot of these here, uric acid, ketone bodies, not all of them will be in high amounts or even at all. They're just components that you would find in urine. So we have a little dipstick that we're gonna, it'll react to whatever the presence of in your urine. You might be, hopefully you're negative for most of the things on this test. So for instance, you show that you're positive for something like glucose, then you know you've exceeded the renal threshold for glucose, and now that's spilled over into the urine or various proteins. The dipstick test can actually measure specific gravity. I have another way to show you how specific gravity was traditionally measured, but because specific gravity is a, a measure of the concentration of urine, they've now developed a way for that to react and gives you a sense of that. So we can compare that if you want to or show you traditionally how it's great. Um, nitrates and ketones, leukocytes. Erase all this. The other thing that we're also going to look at is a physical examination. So we, I care that you know about sediment. Sediment is going to be like things like leukocytes, like a cell. Pretty much all of these things too would be considered sediment. These are things that after we take our urine, we put them in a centrifuge and we spin it, or put them in a test tube and we spin it around in a centrifuge, the sediment is going to be these little particles that are at the very bottom of the tube. And we're gonna ultimately take those particles out and put them onto a microscope slide and look at them. So what sediment is, is physically something that you can see with the eye, obviously through a microscope though, because it'll be tiny. But something like glucose, you're not gonna see glucose. So that's something that's going to be a dissolved component. Ketones are dissolved components, where a cell is sediment. So just, I, I have some test questions that utilize that distinction. Tell me which of the following would be sediment in urine. Which of the following are dissolved elements in urine? So dissolved elements like glucose, like pH, ketones, sediment, cells, mucus, crystals, casts, things that you're going to physically see here. It's super easy. So because if you have excessive amounts of protein, protein urea. Excess amounts of glucose, Glycosuria. Most of these tell you exactly what they are. If you happen to have ketone bodies in the urine, ketone urea. You might be more acidic, 
that's going to be a problem if you're too acidic in your urine. If you have too many bile pigments from the breakdown of red blood cells, bilirubinuria. I'm going to skip down to the last line. If you have red blood cells, which are not normally something that we would want to leave the blood and enter the urine, you have hematuria. So they all say pretty much, you could pretty much extrapolate exactly what they do. I skip the leukocytes because that's the only one that just has a word that doesn't seem related. It's a little less logical. Leukocytes, meaning the presence of white blood cells, like you have an infection because white blood cells are in your urine, that's known as pyuria. So this here is more of a summary of the kidney anatomy that really just shows you once urine is made, it leaves the collecting ducts. So you start from the renal papilla, which is at the bottom of each of these pyramids. And once it leaves that renal papilla on the bottom of each of the pyramids, it's now urine. So it goes in the minor calyx, kind of bunches up together the major calyx, then it goes in the renal pelvis, out of the kidney, down the ureter. It's gonna go in the bladder, and then when it leaves the bladder to go outside of the body, that's the urethra. This is a cool picture of kidney. I love this picture because you really can see up high like a little minor calyx up there going to, you know, coalescing into a major calyx. And then you have the renal sign or sort of renal pelvis. Then we have the ureters going down. But it is also a picture like this that makes some of the anatomy drawings inaccurate because it looks like the ureters are just going to the top part of the bladder when that's wrong. It actually continues behind, if the bladder's like a big bubble sitting here on the table, it's gonna continue behind the bladder to the floor and enter the bladder at that point. And this is also a picture where you can see the two black arrows, of basically those are the ureters coming from the kidneys coming in and it heads into the bladder but you can see it's i have the dotted line showing that it went behind the kidney but it's entering at these two dots right here so that's why that one's circled so this is the entrance these little holes right here are where the ureters are feeding into the bladder and then we have the hole here, it's just kind of weird. It looks like it's shaped like a funnel, but you wanna just think of the bladder being this bubble. So you have these two holes to the back, but on the floor, but think of it still flat. And then a little bit further forward, maybe tip down a little bit, is gonna be the drain hole out to the body. That would be the urethral exit. And you have the two ureter entrances on the back. So the key here, and so before I move to the next slide that we'll talk about this formation, is the peristalsis movement. So the ureters coming down are squeezing and bringing the urine down that way. That's why you can still pee in space. You don't need gravity. You can pee. Think about the urine, the bladder. It can expand quite a bit and it can shrink quite a bit. So what other organ in our body expands quite a bit and shrinks down quite a bit? The stomach. So the inside is, gonna, is called rugae, the same as the stomach. The inside, when it's shrunk down and there's no urine in there or little urine, the inside's gonna be all folded up just like an empty stomach. And then that way, when the your bladder fills up, it's gonna get really smoothed out. It also is the only place in our body that has transitional epithelial tissue. So if you guys remember from 201, transitional epithelial tissue looks like stratified squamous epithelial tissue where all the cells are stacked up like on, like on your skin. But then when the bladder is expanded, those shift around. So there's only like a couple thick. They go from like 15 to 20 to like, you know, three to five. So they move around, which is unique. We don't only have the epithelial tissue moving around a lot. So this is unique to the bladder. We talked about the sphincters, the internal being smooth muscle which is involuntary. The external is skeletal muscle, which is voluntary. So if you're potty training a kid, you're training the external urethral sphincter. Same as the um, sphincters in the rectum. The important takeaway from this particular slide is the trigone. The trigone is the formation of the two ureter openings on the back 
inferior portion of the bladder and the single urethral opening of the front coming, the urine going out. So even though we talked about the rugae scrunching of the bladder or the bladder enlarging, the trigone area stays the same. It's pretty consistent. So everything else is moving around it. The trigone is a unique feature of the, ure of the bladder that you need to know about. What the urethra is, going from the bladder out the body. In males, there's three parts to it. In females, there's just the one part. So the membranous urethra is really going from the bladder across the membrane. It's not really a membrane, but it's really your torso. Well, you know, basically going from inside across your body so you're outside. So females, that's all we have. Males, because males have a prostate and a penis, they get extra sections of their urethra. So in this picture, this is being the bladder. So you know, the ureters are kind of coming in really high. This here is the prostate. So this is prostatic urethra. Then we have membranous urethra, which is going to the outside. And then we have the penile, also known as a spongy urethra, because when we get to the reproductive system, the specific tissue that surrounds the urethra and the penis is called corpora spongiosum. So there's a very specific reason why it's spongy. But that'll be, the issues with that will be later. So fluids, electrolytes, and pH, it really is about, this is really a very general subset to this. So like big picture stuff here. We're looking at where's the fluids in the body? How do we move fluids in the body? And pH, where does acidity come from? And what do we do to deal with acidity? I mean, so it's really these big picture things, big compartments of how this works. So the first part is just the fluid compartments of the body. We have extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. The element here is the vast majority of fluid that makes up our body is going to be two thirds of the body is going to be intracellular. So all the stuff that we talk about, lymphatic fluid, cerebral, spinal fluid, blood plasma, all the stuff that we make a big deal about is really only one third of the fluid that's in our body anyways. So what's in the cells is critically important. We've seen this before. Hormonal influences on fluids and electrolytes. All right, an electrolyte, one example is sodium. We talked about things that move sodium around. Aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and atrial natriuretic peptide. They move sodium and therefore they move water. Pretty much that's all, I'm the, that's the only point I'm making with this. You obviously need to know the details of these and a little bit more in the context of what they do when we talk about the kidney but in this fluid electrolyte balance, just realize, hey, if we're moving water around, we have hormones that can make this happen. Again, general big picture thing. This is a little more detail, but what we already talked about with what, how antidiuretic hormone works, how aldosterone works, and atrial metric peptide. So again, this is just a review recap for what was already talked about with regard to the distal convoluted tubule in the kidney. Electrolytes are the charged particles, charged ions, charged molecules. The three main functions, and there's way more than three, so these are just big categories. Cell metabolism and body structures. That's a big job, like bone formation, like body, like ions are needed to make sure your body's functioning properly, the metabolism and just the building, basic building blocks of our body. Water balance between compartments, let's move sodium, let's send water moves around. So we need ions to do this kind of work for us and to maintain our proper pH along with our soluble proteins. So with these three categories, you literally couldn't name anything that ions are not involved in. So the point of this is how important ions are to our health. It's the proportion of these ions that's going to be the result of some pathology if they're out of balance. The electrolyte balance, I'm gonna skip this and just go to the next slide. The important electrolytes are all listed here. There are many more ions that are important. These are the big six. Sodium, we talk about it. Potassium, 
We already talked about sodium and potassium in 201 to, with regard to depolarization and repolarization of neurons. We talked about it in 202 with regard to depolarization and repolarization of cardiac um, myocytes. Magnesium plays a huge role. In fact, potassium and magnesium are two of our most deficient ions. And a significant number of health conditions could be alleviated if we just had appropriate um, balances of sodium and magnesium, hypertension, cardiac um, health, and a number of other things. So a lot of people, especially with cardiomyopathies, weak heart contraction often become better with appropriate levels of magnesium. Potassium is our natural offset or off balance to sodium. So someone tends to have more sodium-based, salt-based hypertension, lowering your sodium but raising your potassium will help that. Magnesium also for hypertension. We know calcium stimulates muscle contraction. So think of magnesium as the balancer for calcium. So in fact, people that have hypertension and especially a specific kind of hypertension, if they're not only given calcium channel blockers, but extra magnesium, that can actually help their hypertension. So the important electrolytes, you can look at their little subscripts. Osmotic concentration for sodium, that's moving water around. Membrane potential, that's the depolarizing story. Potassium, membrane potential, that's the repolarizing story. And the balance of them help maintain our resting membrane potential. So that's nerve function. We also have a role for calcium and magnesium in bone, calcium's in muscle function. Cofactors means they're involved in all kinds of biochemistry. We know calcium is involved in blood clotting. Remember, we used that as an example for one. So I really want to point out that electrolytes are pretty much used for pretty much anytime you have any chemical process going on in our body, which is what makes the world go around our body, it's an electrolyte that's involved. That's all. So it's just meant to highlight the importance and in general, something that it does. It does everything. pH acid base balance. I want you to think of it in two ways. Source. Where do we get? Where do we get our H pluses? Which is going to drop our pH. What are the reasons for it? And then how do we deal with it? That's the categories I want you to think of as we go through the next couple slides. As a recap, anything that is an acid is something that's going to give off an H plus. So when we have H pluses flying around, that's going to be acidic. Anytime we have something, say we have a protein that binds the H plus, just kind of locks onto it so it's no longer running around free, you got a leash on it, you've saved, you've solved your acidity problem. It's sort of, it's invisible, if you will. It's only considered to be acidic or even your little litmus paper, you put it in a beaker and if you have a bunch of H pluses running around, it's gonna be more acidic. If you put something that binds the H pluses, even though they're still in there, but they're bound to now a protein like albumin, all of a sudden you'll have a neutral pH. Even though you didn't get rid of it, it's still there, but it's now buffered. So the idea of acidity is just loose H pluses. If you want to think of that, that's all. The normal pH people always think of is if you're at seven, seven's the middle. And if you're below seven, you're acidic. And if you're above seven, you're alkaline. The human body's a little bit off from that. So the human body's normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. So true acidosis is still in the seven range, but it's below 7.35. And true alkalosis is above 7.45. The sources of H pluses are these protons, are really protein, fat and protein metabolism. Anaerobic respiration, which is just a fancy way of saying lactic acid. So you can see these things aren't happening all the time. They're just ways that we're going to be producing acid if we have an excessive amount. Carbon dioxide. Well, we're making that all the time. 
but if maybe we're not breathing off as much, maybe we have a respiration issue that the CO2 levels are gonna build, you can get acidotic, you can have an effect on that. So these are just things that are gonna influence our body's pH. And that's really, those are the three main things. A metabolism of fat and protein, so I have them listed on different lines there. Anaerobic um, respiration, just normal carbon dioxide formation. How do we deal with it? Well, we do it chemically. So we have a chemical bu buffer system. And what a chemical buffer system is, we're gonna get a protein or some other chemical. Uh, one protein could be like albumin. And the H pluses that are flying free actually gets tethered. So now we have an H plus and we like to think of these chemical buffers as a sponge. We have respiratory regulation. So our CO2, as long as we're breathing our CO2 out, we're reducing CO2 and that gets rid of it. Renal regulation. In the kidneys, we have two ways um, that we actually bind to, we have two ways that we're going to bind H pluses to. In the kinos, this will be renal regulation. That's actually going to then send it out into the urine. So we'll go into the details of these. The chemical buffer systems are proteins, like albumin is one of our main ones. It's just a big giant protein. Think of it as an H plus sponge. Hemoglobin can also do the job. It's not really its main job, but it can do it bicarbonate, we can actually make bicarbonate in the blood that's gonna help bind it. And then we have phosphate. Phosphate's gonna be more, is gonna be one of these. So it says it's intracellular. Well, specifically, we're gonna talk about it with regard to the kidney. So this is just breathing off, respiratory regulation. The last one is the renal one. So phosphate and ammonia. In the tubules, the tubules make these two things the phosphate and ammonia, and they will bind to an H plus. So if you're at the Bowman's capsule and you've got all this waste coming in and somebody's acidotic, you have extra H pluses in, in that. We don't really want to reabsorb that, but they're so tiny that they could just zip over more easily back into the blood. So if we can make phosphate and ammonia that's going to put a leash on it and bind to it, we can then send it out. So the kidney's responsible for the long-term regulation of our pH. That's the biggest issue. As a recap for the kidneys, urinary system, you should know basic gross anatomy, cortex, medulla, the components within there. You've got the columns, you've got the pyramids, you have the papilla, you have the vessels going through the arteries. You have, you know, we have the renal artery, segmental artery, lobar artery, interlobar, arcuate and interlobular, going into afferent arterioles. You follow the anatomy down to the point of a nephron from afferent arterial you go into the glomerulus and the efferent come in the other side. At the glomerulus, you have your Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, lupa henle, distal convoluted tubule. What is the job of each of those three sections? Dumps, whatever's left in the tubule gets dumped into a collecting duct. That gets run down to the bottom of the pyramid, out the papilla, drip, drip, that's urine. The urine then follows the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, goes into the back bottom side of the bladder. You have the trigone, the two ureteral entrances and the one urethral exit, goes out the body. Um, you should know the physiology as far as filtration, reabsorption, secretion, what are abnormal constituents of urine, what are things that get secreted, what are things that get reabsorbed. You should know the way that we influence blood pressure it happens at the distal convoluted tubule, first and foremost. That's the location that that effect's going to take place at. And then we have two hormones that will reabsorb sodium and therefore reabsorb water. And we have one hormone that will dump sodium and dump water. And then we have angiotensin II, which is going to cause mesovagal constriction. The fine tuning of the juxtaglomerular apparatus is we have the macula densa that's got part of it in the distal convoluted tubule to check the concentration of what's being delivered out of our body via pee compared to what's coming into the afferent arterial. 
We also have the juxtaglomerular cells that sense oxygen, the chemoreceptors that release rearithropoietin with low oxygen. They also have baroreceptors that sense pressure and it releases renin in the response to low pressure. So if all of that is just kind of put together that you feel like you got kind of a handle on it, then it's just a matter of kind of sorting it through and get it, but at least you have kind of a good base to where to begin.